It's that time of year when a lot of people are starting to see a rash on their skin that looks like this. As a dermatologist, I'm diagnosing it more and more, and the summertime is super common to see this rash called tinea versicolor. I'm gonna talk about some of the most effective treatments for it today and how you can avoid it from coming back year after year. Hello, I'm Dr. Dustin Fortella, board certified dermatologist, and I'm here to help you save money by understanding your skin better and making the right choices for your own skincare. So what is tinea versicolor? Tinea versicolor is also called pityriasis versicolor and it is caused by a yeast that lives on the skin. That yeast comes in the family of malassezia. And if you've heard that term before, it's because malassezia yeast are a common organism that lives on everybody and they can be contributing factors to this rash, tinea versicolor, but they can also play a role in fungal acne, so to speak, or in seborrheic dermatitis, which is the medical diagnosis for the term dandruff. This malassezia yeast likes to live on the skin and it feeds off the oils that your skin produces. We have a high concentration of oil glands on the head, on the face, and on the upper parts of our trunk. And that's why these types of rashes like seborrheic dermatitis and dandruff, like tinea versicolor, and like fungal acne, all appear in this same distribution because of the high concentration of oil glands. Now, for most people that develop tinea versicolor, they're not going to experience a lot of symptoms. They just happen to notice it one day, and usually in the summer, because it often has multiple colors associated with it, and as you go outside and you start to develop a little bit of a tan, it really creates a lot of contrast between normal skin and the skin that is affected by the tinea versicolor. So it's pretty common that somebody will just be getting out of the shower, they'll catch a glance of themselves in the mirror and realize they've got some crazy rash all over their skin. Even though they have this big rash, they probably weren't that itchy. Now occasionally they will be a bit itchy and oftentimes even just over-the-counter moisturizers can help with that. But the striking appearance of the rash often brings them into the office for a diagnosis and treatment. One of the most frustrating parts about treating tinea versicolor, however, is that it has a really high recurrence rate, meaning it's really likely to come back either later in the year or every year it kind of pops up around that summertime. And again, the reason for that is that this is a common organism that lives on just about everybody. And once in a while it overgrows because of the composition of the oil on your skin. It finds a more hospitable environment to really kind of explode. Even though it's not terribly symptomatic, it's just really happy to grow all over that sebaceous rich area of your body. So as we mentioned, tinea versicolor. Tinea is kind of the thing that indicates fungus. When we say pityriasis, pityriasis is a descriptive term for the type of fine scale that this rash produces. And then the other word here, versicolor, means many colors. And so that's one of the clues to this diagnosis is that an individual may have that rash and it may cause brown spots to appear, it may cause white spots to appear, or it may cause red spots to appear. The red spots can happen because of inflammation or irritation. Your immune system can react against the presence of this organism. And so you're gonna get some redness or inflammation against that and you're gonna see those red patches pop up. Sometimes that inflammation causes pigment release from your melanocytes and we'll start to see some brown spots. And sometimes we see white spots because as this little fungus consumes the oil from your body, it produces something called dicarboxylic acid. Dicarboxylic acid can help to shut down your melanocytes, can help to turn off their pigment production, and so you end up with white spots. Something important to know is that even though we successfully can treat tinea versicolor, although it has a high recurrence rate, even when we appropriately treat it, you may be left with discoloration, especially that white discoloration, for several weeks to months because those melanocytes have been affected and they have to regenerate and make more melanin and transfer those into your keratinocytes and that process can take several weeks. So even though you still see the white spots, it doesn't mean that the rash has come back. Uh, or that it was inappropriately treated. It just means that the pigment hasn't returned to those areas yet. Let's talk about some of the treatments that can be used for tinea versicolor. Briefly, I wanna touch on the prescription treatments that we will give a patient when they come into the office, and then we're gonna talk about some of the most effective over-the-counter treatments that you can go pick up right now. In the office when somebody comes in, this is typically a pretty easy diagnosis to make. It's really rare that we would ever have to do a biopsy. If we do want to do a diagnostic test in the office, we'll do something called a skin scraping, where we take a razor blade and we don't cut the skin, but we just scratch on top to kind of pull some of that scale off and we put it onto a microscope slide and we look under the microscope and it's pretty easy to identify the little uh, buds of yeast and the hyphae that are present on that microscope slide. 
It's characteristically called a spaghetti and meatballs look or a ziti and meatballs look where we can see all of those hyphae and those little budding spores of yeast and it really seals the diagnosis. Once we know for sure what we're treating, we often move on to prescription treatments. Topical treatments are usually sufficient to treat tinea versicolor, and the prescription topical treatments that we'll often use is a cream like ketoconazole cream or econazole cream, and these are antifungal medications. We can also use naftaphine or terbinafine, and some of those like terbinafine are even available over the counter in a cream form. If somebody has a really extensive case or they do have symptoms like significant itching or they need to get clear fast because they're going to a wedding or some other event and they just really want to get their skin clear, we will move on to oral treatments in some cases and we'll use you know, oral itraconazole or oral fluconazole, which is a really common antifungal medication. And generally it just takes one or two doses. And a little hack that you can use is, I recommend to my patients after you take that medicine, 30 to 60 minutes later, go outside, go running, go do something to work up a sweat because the medicine will then come out through the sweat glands because that yeast lives on the skin. That's where we want to deliver the medicine to. It can be hiding down in your hair follicles. So those sweat glands that are attached to those hair follicles, we want to get the medicine delivered to that point so that we get the most effective treatment of Available. So the oral medications can be really effective to help eradicate tinea versicolor quickly, but remember that you can still have discoloration for quite some time, and there's not really an effective way to speed that up. If you do have discoloration from tinea versicolor, it's important not to get a tan because that just increases the contrast between the affected skin and the normal skin because that affected skin isn't going to tan in the same way that your normal skin is. So we, as dermatologists, want you to avoid getting a tan anyway, so it's just good practice to try to keep your skin without a tan so that you don't notice the rash quite as much. Now while those prescription treatments are highly effective, there's also very effective treatments that you can get over the counter. Some of those same active ingredients that I mentioned are available over the counter. I really like to recommend that individuals pick up Nizoral shampoo or Ketoconazole shampoo. That's available in a 1% formulation over the counter or I can prescribe it in a 2% formulation. And what I have my patients do is use that as a body wash. So just because it's a shampoo doesn't mean it has to be used only on the scalp. You can lather that up and you can use it as a body wash. You can use ketoconazole, Nizoral shampoo, you can use uh, head and shoulders, clinical strength, something that has selenium sulfide in it. There's a role also for zinc pyrethione, and these ingredients can help to kill that yeast that is causing tinea versicolor. When using a shampoo as a body wash, it's ideal to lather up, get that on the skin, and let it sit for five to 10 minutes so it has time to act on the yeast before you rinse it off. If you put it on and rinse it off too quickly, you may not get the effect that you're looking for. You can also purchase over-the-counter antifungal treatments like terbinafine or like clotrimazole. Some of these can be helpful, but it also is sometimes difficult to rub a cream all over your body. I find that the shampoos are quite easy to apply because you can lather up and just let them run over the skin. Now, because of the high recurrence rate of tinea versicolor, I recommend that you don't stop treating for it. Now, if you're on an oral medication, you don't need to keep taking that oral medication for weeks and weeks, but it's really a good idea to take either that prescription shampoo or the over-the-counter shampoo and continue to use that as a body wash one to two times a week. That's not gonna hurt you in any way, and it can be really effective in a preventive role to keep that rash from coming back. Now, as with anything in dermatology or medicine in general, if you have a suspected diagnosis and you pursue a treatment that should work for that diagnosis and you don't get better, it's important to go see a physician because you could have the wrong diagnosis. There's other things that can look like tinea versicolor, such as vitiligo or even forms of skin lymphoma. That's really uncommon though. I don't wanna worry you about those things. But in general, if you're doing something and it's not resolving the problem, you need to consider other diagnoses and seek the help of a physician. Vitiligo is where the immune system attacks the melanocytes or those pigment producing cells. Now that can happen on the trunk, but it's much more common initially to see that happen on the face, around the eyes, around the mouth, or on the hands you know, near the fingertips. We see that much more commonly. It doesn't often first appear on the trunk. And then hypopigmented or white forms of skin lymphoma are really not seen very commonly and they often have other symptoms like significant itching. I'll share some links for you guys to some of these recommended over-the-counter treatments down in the video description. And if you have questions about this diagnosis or other things that you'd like to have more information on, be sure to leave that down in the comments below.
Thank you for watching. Do me a favor and share this video on social media. Be sure to tag me at 208 Skin Doc on all social media platforms. And I look forward to seeing you back on the next video.